you have your Bible tonight and will turn with us to the second chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Romans, the second chapter, and I'd like to read several verses from this chapter. This is one of the many chapters in Romans that are misunderstood. In fact, there are 16 chapters in Romans that are misunderstood, and this is one of them. Let me read. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure, or we know, that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? And when he says here that these men do the same things, he doesn't mean identical things, but he means same in the sense that when you look down to Skid Row, or you look to Russia and look at a man like Stalin, and you say, my, that man should be judged, or that man should be dealt with. May I say to you that when you say that, you set up the system whereby God, who is higher above you than you are above that individual, he has the right, therefore, to judge you. And you do the same things in the sense that you do things that he can judge and does judge, because you do not meet his standard any more than Stalin meets your standard or the man on Skid Row meets your standard. That's what Paul means in this passage here, I think. Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance of long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing, or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of man, by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now, that's one of the most profound passages in the Scripture. This evening, we're speaking on the subject, Are the heathen lost who have not heard the gospel? When Dr. Harry Rimmer died, Dr. John Brown, who was then alive, who owned KGER, he called me and told me that he had asked Dr. Harry Rimmer a couple of years before that to begin a program on the station in which questions were sent in 
and he would answer those questions. And he asked me if I would be willing to take that program. And that program has now been on more than 15 years that I have had it, and questions are sent in by listeners. We've never had to resort to the trickery that some use of writing their own questions. We have right now upstairs more questions than I could possibly answer in the next six months. It's become a very popular program indeed. And I took the program, of course, with fear and trembling to follow a man like Dr. Harry Rimmer. But we've attempted to move it from questions that have to do with the field of apologetics into the field of that which is practical and that which gets down into shoe leather. And we have rejoiced in the response to it. But I discovered that there are about a dozen questions that occur repeatedly on the program. About every four months, there are a dozen questions that will come back, sometimes more often. And our subject that we have tonight is one of those questions. It's one that comes to us probably more than any other question that comes to us. Now, may I say to you tonight that when that question comes for the radio, I am always reluctant to answer it, because I have one answer for the unsaved who comes with an assumed anguish that the heathen are lost, and they put up a false facade to cover up his or her refusal to accept the grace of God. And the question generally comes like this. What about the poor Chinese that never heard the gospel? And when I hear that question, I always feel like saying to that unsaved fellow, let's not talk about the poor Chinese who have not heard the gospel, but let's talk about you who have heard the gospel and done nothing about it, because I want to say to you, I won't be too sure about the heathen, but I can be very sure of what's going to happen to you. I'd like to keep it in that area, but of course you can't keep it in that area. Then I have an, another answer for sincere Christians who want to face the reality of the Word of God. Now, to the unsaved, we'd approach it something like this. If we get to heaven, and I find that there's some there who never heard the gospel, I'm not going to be unhappy. In fact, the matter is, I'm going to be overjoyed. If I find that some of the Mohegan Indians who lived in New England before the pilgrims landed are in heaven, I'll rejoice. If I get to heaven and find that some of the Incas from South America are there and they live before Americus Vespucius landed there, I will rejoice for them. If I get to heaven and find that there's some from the mountainous regions of Tibet are there, again, I'm going to rejoice. I will rejoice in the grace of God that could provide a righteousness that would enable a sinner to live in the presence of the holiness of God and not soil a dirty heaven. I'll rejoice in that. And I'll say how wonderful is the grace of God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And it'll be more amazing because it'll be more wonderful because I'm going to be there. And I won't deserve to be there because when he saved me, he saved a sinner who deserved to go to hell. I had no capacity for heaven whatsoever and have very little today. 
But I rejoice in his grace, and if I could sing, I would sing tonight, Wonderful Savior, wonderful friend, wonderful life that shall never end, wonderful place he's gone to prepare, wonder of wonders, I shall be there. I tonight marvel at the grace of God that saved me. On the other hand, here's another if, on the other hand, if we get to heaven and if we find that there are no Mohegans there and we find that the Incas who lived before America's Vespucius arrived in South America are not there and the Chinese that you who are unsaved profess that you're so distressed about are not there, I will be forced to quote to you a few verses a little later on in Romans, in Romans 3, 5, and 6. I'd read this to you, but if our unrighteousness command the righteousness of God, what shall we say is God unrighteous? who taketh vengeance, God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? And I'd turn over to Romans 9, 14 and read again, Is there unrighteousness with God? And then I'd give Paul's answer, God forbid, that regardless of what you might think or feel or understand tonight because of your limited knowledge and my limited knowledge, we can be sure of one thing, that whatever God does, he's right in doing it. He'll not only do his will, but his will will be right, and even the unsaved will see that someday. But tonight... I'm speaking, I know, to believers. And I must be very candid tonight with the text that we have. I'd like to read it to you. It's here in the second chapter of Romans. It's verses 11 and 12. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And I'll not be evasive tonight, as I've heard some. And I'll not use theological jargon. I'll not do a theological trapeze performance. May I say it very bluntly and very plainly tonight. There is no hope for man out of Christ. The Word of God makes it very clear that God has only one way of saving sinners. He's never had but one way of saving sinners, and that's through the death of Christ and his resurrection, and that apart from that, men are lost. Now, that is the compelling motive that has sent men and women away from homes and loved ones and comforts out yonder into a foreign country into the bush because they believe that men are lost without the gospel. May I say to you tonight that that is the only motive for sending missionaries, is that men are lost without Christ. And we've been given a command to go to the ends of the earth with this gospel. Now, I recognize that tonight that this doctrine is unpalatable to the natural man. I think he hates this above everything else. There are many Christians that do not wish to face the stark reality, 
And many churches today have gone undercover, as it were. Some 20 years ago, a survey was made of ministers in this country relative to major doctrines. One of the questions was, do you believe in a literal hell? Ninety percent of the preachers that were interviewed said they did not believe in hell. That was 20 years ago. I wonder how small that percentage is tonight. The Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York had a pastor many years ago, and a friend who was there saw it in the bulletin. There was a statement in the bulletin that said, We are through with the hellish doctrine that God would damn souls. We do not believe in a literal hell. May I say to you that today there are many, even in our fundamental circles, that will avoid this question. Will you look at our texts again tonight? For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Now, men can only be saved who trust Christ. And the natural assumption and the popular assumption is that men are lost today because they have not heard the gospel. May I say that's not true. Souls are lost today not because they have not heard about Christ, but because they have adopted a life course of sin. Will you listen to this very carefully? For as many as have sinned without law, that is, without any knowledge of the book at all, they'll perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law, that is, with the revelation, they will be perished or judged by the law. Now, will you note something that's very important? This is what is known in the Greek as the aorist tense. Dr. Newell calls this here a total life that's given over to sinning, a life that is given over to sinning. The idea today that out among lost people that you have some folk that really are very nice and they don't deserve to be lost at all, that they are not sinners. The Word of God says that every lost man, that includes you and it includes me, was given over. The total life was given over to sinning. And aren't we seeing that abroad today as the laws are being lifted and the bands that have helped man are being lifted? What direction are they going today with all the liberty they have? Are they turning to God? Are they becoming better? Are they headed the other direction? Are they becoming lawless today? I was rather shocked to read in the paper that the government is investigating the First Presbyterian Church in Chicago. It looks like I'm picking on the Presbyterians tonight, and if you want to know the truth, I am. I happen to have been one of them one time, and I hate to see a great church that I love go the direction it's going today. They're investigating that church because imagine in this church that, if I recall correctly, this church was at one time as fundamental as the church of the open door. And don't you believe this church can't go that direction? We do not know how bad the human heart really is. And in that church, they're investigating because it's become a headquarters for a group that are given over to sexual laxity and gross immorality. Imagine our church becoming headquarters for that type of thing in our day. 
Is God wrong when he says that those without the law are given over to a life of sinning? That's the picture of mankind, if you please, whether he has a revelation or whether he doesn't have a revelation, he is a sinner, and he is in a life of sinning and rebellion against God. Some time ago, I made this distinction between God's law and man's law. Before man's law today, in our law courts, a man is innocent until he's proven guilty. And we have some courts today that prove him innocent even when he is guilty. They're really leaning over backwards in that direction. In other words, a man is not a thief until he steals, according to man's law. Now, that may be proper, and I don't debate that. But God's law is the opposite from that. God says man steals because he is a thief and that man murders because he's a murderer at heart, and that it's a heart attitude. And God says he does not look upon the outward appearance as men do. God looks at the heart, and God says the heart is desperately wicked, and all the world is guilty before him. Therefore, God looks upon every man as guilty, not innocent. He's guilty before God. Oh, if we could only get that through tonight to you. This idea today that man in this world is on trial, that God's standing over, he's seeing whether he's going to be a good little boy or a bad little boy. God says he's a bad little boy. God says he's already lost. And that that is his bent. Romans 2 it's been misunderstood because it's not the basis on which God saves man. You read this entire chapter. Paul, in chapter 2, is not even attempting to present God's salvation. Paul, if he's anything, he's logical. And the first part of Romans, he's not attempting to prove, he just merely states that man is a sinner. And he looks at him in every department, and in this section, he's looking at so-called good people in the world, the moral people, the people that meet in Los Angeles in a committee to help the poor people. God says they are guilty before him, and this is the basis on which he'll judge them, not save them. It has nothing to do with salvation. It's the basis on which God will judge them. And he puts down here six tremendous principles. Now, one of these principles is in our text tonight. For there is no respect of persons with God. Now, again, according to our civilization, there is a respect of persons. And I won't argue against that. I think it's proper. I think it's proper that the candidates for president right now should have a guard. I don't think they should give Vernon McGee one. He may need one after this message, but I don't think they ought to give him one. I do not have that kind of a position. I think there should be respect of persons, and that's one reason that I think we should respect the policeman. He represents an authority. You may not like the man. Some of them not very nice. But that hasn't anything to do with it. He represents an authority. He represents the law. And we should have respect. That's something we've forgotten in this land of ours. I recognize in our civilization, if it's to survive, there must be a respect. But when God looks down at man, he doesn't see a judge or a politician or a preacher or a policeman. God sees them all just the same. There is no respect of persons before God. And it's not a question now of this fellow. His name is Joe Stalin. I asked a man this question. He said to me, I don't, McGee, I don't believe in a hell. 
I said, would you tell me where you would put Joe Stalin? Well, he says, I certainly wouldn't let him go to heaven. Well, then I said, you'd have to have some place for him. Now, I said, if you want to put another label up on it, you can. But let's understand one thing. God has put a label there, made it very clear what he's talking about, if you please. We have a notion today that there are differences in sinners, no respect of persons with God. And there are a lot of people today that say, I'm not guilty of some serious crime, and because I'm not, I shouldn't go to hell. A man out in Altadena told me years ago why he said, McGee, you needn't talk to me about needing a Savior. I don't need a Savior. He said, now, the message that he came down here one Sunday, by the way, he said, the message you give is good for Skid Row, but it's not good for a self-respecting, law-abiding citizens. And he said, I'm a law-abiding citizen. He said, now, I never got a traffic ticket. And he said, I've heard you on the radio say you have. He said, therefore, I'll take my chances before God. Now, that's the great fallacy of the day, that because they're not guilty of some serious crime, that they're not lost. And a man who's not bad is another man. He ought to escape. Reminds me of the story of the two boys in school. The teacher on the exam gave one question, and the, the question in mathematics was, how much is five times five? One of the boys put down 30. The other boy put down 35. And the teacher marked them both zero. And the boy that got 30 put up his hand. He said, teacher, I think it's unfair. And the teacher said, why? Well, you said it's 25. Five times five is 25. I said 30. He said 35. And I'm just half as wrong as he is. I'm just five off. He's ten off. And I don't think I ought to get zero. May I say to you, may I be very careful in saying this, but both the boys are wrong. And there happens to be between one and a million, one million whole numbers. 999,999 of those are wrong. Every one of them's wrong, only one's right. That's 25. All of them are wrong. God has provided one right way to keep heaven clean and holy, and yet bring sinners out of a lost world into heaven. He has one way. And 999,999 of them are wrong. These ways won't bring you there. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Those 999,999 ways will not bring you to heaven. And I don't care who you are tonight or how good you think you are. In God's sight, you're guilty. And if you were taken to heaven without God's way of salvation and saved by the blood of Christ, you'd not be fit for heaven. The only way in the world God can make sinners fit for heaven is His way. And that was by giving His Son to die upon the cross. In fact, that is the thing that's given him a right even today to reach into the heart of a believer. He couldn't touch Vernon McGee tonight with a 20-foot pole if Christ had not died for my sin nature. That's the message of the fifth chapter of Romans, sixth chapter of Romans. That's the message that he has for you and me tonight, that he's unable to move in even today, but he's yet 
to make us like his Son. And the only way he can do it is this way, my beloved. Therefore, there are two companies of sinners in which there are no respect of person. There are those that are sinners who have the law. They have a revelation. They'll be judged according to it. The light that they have is the Word of God. They're lost. Yes, but aren't the others judged according to the light they have? May I say to you, the sinners are lost. They perish without the law. Why? Because they have not heard of Christ? No. They have a life given over to sin. One made a choice for sin with the law. The other made a choice for sin without the law, my beloved. When Adam fell, Adam had a will to sin, the evil, but he had no power to do the good. When God told him not to eat of that tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, he was able to do the evil. But he had no power to resist it at all. He had no power to do the good. And we must assume that there's no one who has not heard the gospel that would have turned to Christ had it been preached to them. The heathen tonight are not begging to hear the gospel. I have a friend, he and I were in seminary together, graduated together, and we couldn't wait to get out. We thought the world was waiting for us. I had the foolish notion that they are just waiting for me to get there. And I found out they weren't waiting for me. In about six months, I got a letter from him. He went as a missionary to Africa. He said, I thought they were waiting for me over here the way they talked. To us as missionaries, but he said they weren't waiting for me. Other than this, they were waiting to send me back home. They were not wanting me. May I say to you tonight, friends, you and I live in a world that's not begging for the gospel. If you have that notion, you have the wrong notion. But if tonight there is somewhere an unsaved man who will turn to Christ, God will get the gospel to him. You want the scriptural example? Cornelius was, according to what the Word of God said, he was a good man. He was a good man according to Roman standards. And yet he was not saved. He was a lost man, even with all of his goodness. It said that he gave liberally. It said that he was religious. It said that he was a man that was known as a good man, and he was a centurion, a Roman centurion. But he was lost. But he had a heart that was open, and God got the gospel to him. I tell you, the Spirit of God manipulated and moved around in order to get even Simon Peter over there to preach the gospel to him. I heard the late Dr. Roland Bingham, the founder of the Sudan Interior Mission, tell this story when I was still in seminary, by the way. He said that years ago there was a missionary on the way to Africa, and the place where his ship was to put in, there was a plague that broke out. Word came that they would not be able to land there, and that was where the missionary was going to get off. And so the captain told the missionary, I'll have to take you on to India. Oh, he said, I, I don't want to go to India. I'm called to go to Africa. I said, would you mind just putting me in a boat and taking me to, out to the shore? And the captain said, that's very foolish. The man said, well, I don't know, but God's called me to go to Africa. I'm sure of that. And if you'll just put me out there on the shore, that's all I'll ask. The captain said, all right, be your funeral. So he put the man's trunk and the man in a little boat and a couple of sailors rowed him out, put him right on the shore. He sat down now on the beach wondering what to do next. There was a tribe inland. The chief of that tribe found a page out of a gospel of John. It was John 3.16. This chief, in fact, most of the tribe could read and understand English, but they had never heard the gospel. 
And that chief said, I'd like to know about the God that loved this world like that. And he sent a couple of runners into the city to find out if anybody could come back and tell his tribe about that God. And the two runners came down the beach while this missionary was sitting there. They showed him the page out of the gospel, this torn sheet, said, Do you know anything about this? God. He said, I sure do. Well, he said, Would you come to our tribe? Our chief would like to have you. And they took his trunk, and he went to the tribe. And a revival broke out there. Literally multitudes were saved. May I say to you tonight, God tonight is just and righteous in what he does. And if there's a man anywhere, God will speak to some heart and get the gospel out there. But tonight, because the gospel has not gone to certain areas, does not mean those people are not lost. And in eternity, they'll never blame God for that. Let me use another homely illustration. Here is a pond down here in Louisiana filled with mud turtles. It's covered with green scum. There is yellow fever. There is everything in that scum. A man comes along, and he's able to talk turtle language, whatever that is. He convinces three of those turtles to fly, and he takes them out, and he teaches them to fly. And they learn to fly, and these three turtles enjoy it. And so these three turtles, they go back, and this pond just filled with turtles. And they say to the other turtles, look, we've been learning to fly. It's great up there. You get out of this scum. You get away from all of this. These turtles down in the scum, they said, you go on and let us alone. We're turtles. We like it down here. You think we'd want to fly up there? You're crazy. We're not interested in it. May I say to you, the unsaved will go into eternity just that way. They never want it. They've sinned without the law. A life bent on sin away from God, they don't want him. Those today around us in Los Angeles and their multitudes living a life of sin bent away from God, and they don't want him. And they're lost with the law. They're lost without the law. Now someone says, but the heathen is saved by the light he has. No, he's never saved by the light he has. Scripture says he's judged by the light that he has. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. It doesn't make any difference who the man is on top side of this earth today. He may be in the jungles of Africa. He may be in the bush in Australia. Or he may be on Sunset Boulevard tonight. Or he may be sitting in the church of the open door. May I say to you, you're not saved by the light you have. You're judged by the light that you have. And God says he's put in all of us a knowledge of right and wrong. And even the heathen that do not have any revelation from God have a knowledge of what's right and what's wrong. Now, it doesn't mean their standard is the same as ours. Their standard is different. A missionary told me that worked among these headhunters for a while. He said, you know, the strangest thing about them was that they were honest. They believe in honesty. He said, you could take your pocketbook out take it into the midst of the compound, you could put it down in the midst of the compound and leave it there overnight, come back the next day, it would be there. They wouldn't touch it. Could you leave it at the corner of 6 and Hope Street tonight? What do you think? They had a knowledge of right and wrong, but they believed in eating one another. In fact, they'd eat their mother-in-law. 
And by the way, think that one over for a while. Is it worse to eat your mother-in-law and be honest, or to be dishonest and not eat your mother-in-law? May I say to you tonight that the heathen tonight has a knowledge of right and wrong, and not a one of them live up to the light they have. Tonight the heathen who lies prostrate before a hideous idol, attempting to mutilate his body, is trying to do something because he knows he's wrong. And that sophisticated man in our culture today who lies on the couch of the psychologist to get rid of a guilt complex has a knowledge of right and wrong. And the hippie that says he's free knows he's not free tonight. And you're not living up to that standard. God will judge, not save, on the basis of the light you have. In John 3, 16, that wonderful verse, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. And don't fiddle around with that word perish and try to make it mean as some here in Southern California do that it means annihilation, or it means an eternal sleep. It means eternal death. And you can't tone it down. Dr. Tari, 50 years ago, preached that in this pulpit right here. I have his statement on that. Now, if you are here tonight, and you say, Ooh, preacher, that's a harsh message. You're right. And if you are here tonight, and you are concerned about the heathen who've not heard, and you think maybe God's being a little unfair, what are you doing to get the gospel to them? I don't mean you have to cross an ocean. I've told several of our missionaries this. The greatest mission field in the world to me is Southern California. There's no mission field like this. The reason that we go on the air three times a day is because I want to get the word out here. And the interesting thing is, I find there are a lot of people that if you put the heathen on the other side of the world, get them out of sight, they like to see your pictures and give you a little offering for mission. But how many are trying to reach Southern California with the gospel? Men are lost, eternally lost, without Christ. That's the teaching of the Word of God. I haven't used boxing gloves tonight. This has been bare knuckle. Somebody needs to say it. I hope you leave here uncomfortable tonight if you're not doing something to get the gospel out in this needy area. Shall we pray?